Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see you here and yeah, thanks for joining us. So uh, Snohomish County has really relied on a number of key uh, partnerships during the pandemic. Uh, of course, our partnership with Snohomish Health District has been great, Doctor, thank you so much. Um, we really came together early as a team and I very much appreciate that partnership, so thank you. Uh, another one is our my office's partnership with the County Council. We've been working closely with the council, particularly Chair Stephanie Wright and Vice Chair Megan Dunn to really make sure that we're addressing the most urgent issues that our residents are facing and our council members hear from residents often as do I. So uh, yesterday, the county council approved the reappropriation of federal CARES Act funds. These are dollars that were appropriated last year but that they really ensure our response can continue while we're waiting for the new federal stimulus package. So a couple of the expenditures I proposed to the council and they approved yesterday. Um, first is $1 million, which is going to allow us to fund additional small businesses who have already applied to the Relief Recovery and Resiliency Program that we refer to as R3. And that R3 grants program is helping businesses impacted by the pandemic with direct grants. Uh, again, businesses that previously applied to the R3 program will be considered for the funding. So we're not reopening the application process, but we had a number of businesses that uh, were not funded uh, the first uh, go around. So <clears throat> this will allow us to help them and they were eligible and worthy. So we're gonna continue to work off our existing list. Uh, another area, one and a half million dollars is going to go toward our innovative nourishing neighborhoods program. So nourishing neighborhoods was really established to provide food in our most at-risk neighborhoods. And it does so by utilizing locally grown produce. So we identified neighborhoods with, uh, with a um, characteristics that uh, uh, lack of food availability and or difficult availability. So those were targeted early on and we've been supporting those for a number of months now. Currently, Nourishing Neighborhoods uh, supports 15 locations and approximately 15,000 of food every two weeks are delivered. The funding will, is going to provide resources to local pantries and pop-up food banks also and continue their, to partner with school districts by providing non-perishable items for their backpack program. So. Nourishing Neighborhoods has been an important uh, food security program for us. Uh, another area, one and a half million dollars will go towards emergency child care uh, for essential workers. And this program really uh, contributes to Snohomish County's recovery and economic development by allowing frontline workers to stay on their job by providing support for child care services. Uh, another two and a half million dollars will go to programs managed by human services. And these include funds to support seniors, enhanced 211 services, uh, community outreach services, and motel vouchers for individuals experiencing homelessness. So that's two and a half million dollars to that um, program. So across county, we continue to work with our partners to address uh, all the areas that uh, COVID is affecting uh, our families and our communities and their businesses. So uh, we'll just keep going until the pandemic is behind us. and. Um, Thanks to the council for their partnership. So with that, I'm handed over to Dr. Spitters from the Snohomish Health District. Okay, thank you, Executive Summers. And uh, great to hear about that assistance coming to the residents of the county. So glad to hear that. Thank you. And uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to just have a few comments today, first starting with uh, some case data and then a little bit more about vaccines. Yesterday, we published updated maps and our routine biweekly report, as well as the new case rate of 71 per 100,000 for the two week period ending March 13. This morning, we published our next mini report on schools, which also includes an expanded table with information on cases in childcare centers and in higher educational facilities. Now, while our biweekly report for Snohomish County shows a slight 8% increase in cases among children ages zero to 14 years, the number of cases in child cares and schools are still relatively low with only four settings across all institutions 
having two or more cases. In the other one, 21 situations or settings where there is a case, uh, there's only one case and, and no spread has occurred. Uh, the total number of cases across schools and child cares in February uh, and trends so far for March show lower numbers than we experienced uh, when cases were increasing and peaking back in November through January. Uh, and uh, this is occurring, so we're seeing these lower numbers as more students are heading back into the classroom. So again, just a, a good signal that uh, the parents, the students, the staff, and the faculty are engaging in those prevention measures that have been shown here and elsewhere to uh, interrupt and, and limit spread of, of COVID in the school community. So all of this is good news. Uh, please keep up the prevention work that you're all doing. You're preventing hospitalizations and deaths while also buying time for us to roll out vaccination to everyone in the county, uh, ultimately, who wants to get it. As a reminder, all of this data that I just mentioned can be found online at our case count uh, page, and I'm just gonna put that in the chat box. So then uh, moving ahead uh, to vaccines, uh, we continue to make progress every day uh, in the county through the mass vaccination sites and through our healthcare system. But unfortunately, our allocation numbers are not keeping pace with our ambition and our capacity to administer the doses. This week's allocation to the county uh, for the week of uh, the 15th through the, the 22nd uh, is about 15,000 doses, give or take a few. So thankfully we've seen a, a heavier weighting of first doses uh, with about 11,000 of the 15,000 total being first doses. We had seen uh, been, been seeing diminishing returns on people coming back for second doses. And so um, uh, we're happy to see more allocation of first doses so that we can get additional people that, that first dose. Um, however, let's keep this 11,000 first dose number in mind as I uh, share some information with you about eligibility expansions occurring. First, uh, the recent expansion to include teachers, school staff, and childcare workers added approximately 30,000 eligible residents to, uh, to for vaccination. The Washington State Department of Health estimates that the next new group, uh, the 1B2 group, becoming eligible tomorrow will add about 50,000 additional residents. So 80,000 residents added to what was uh, previously um, uh, the eligible population of older adults and people over 50 in, in multi-generational households. When we add all those groups together, we get about 300,000 people uh, in Snohomish County uh, who up through today were, were eligible for vaccine. And our estimate is, is uh, we're still working on the, the numbers of doses administered through last week, but uh, roughly we're thinking about 150,000 Snohomish County residents have received at least their first dose through last Saturday. So that leaves another 150,000 eligible people vying for those 11,000 doses this week. So, uh, you know, that means you've got roughly a one in 15 chance of if you're, if you go into find my phase and you qualify uh, and you, you keep that, that confirmation and then you go to vaccine finder and, or to the health district website and try to get a spot at one of the mass sites or one of the healthcare system sites, you know, it's gonna be about a one in 10, one in 15 chance this week. But with each successive week, those chances will increase and ultimately we will get to everyone. So please continue to be patient, don't give up, keep trying and know that your time will come. I'd also like to share a little bit more about that phase 1B2 eligibility I mentioned earlier that's opening up tomorrow. Uh, this includes women ages 16 or older, meaning they're eligible for the vaccine product and who are pregnant, as well as people who are 16 or older who have a disability that puts them at higher risk. Qualifying disabilities include, but are not necessarily limited to Down syndrome, other developmental disabilities, an intellectual disability, hearing impairment, blindness or low vision, or people uh, with both uh, vision and uh, hearing impairments. 
It also includes some high risk critical workers who work in certain uh, sectors in congregate settings, meaning they can't, when they're at work doing their job, they really can't do the physical distancing of six feet that we like to see for, for everyone's safety. This includes um, uh, people also who work for, with the public for at least three hours during a 24 hour day period. So the main sectors these include are agriculture, fishing vessel crews, food processing, grocery store staff, correction staff, prisons, jails, or detention centers, courts, public transit, and any remaining first responders who have not already been vaccinated. Workers in sectors that are not listed above are not eligible at this time unless they meet eligibility criteria for phase 1A as a healthcare or long-term care uh, worker or long-term care resident or 1B1, meaning age over 65 or age over 50 and living in a multi-generational household or uh, working in uh, a school or childcare. Additionally, workers in the industries I did mention that are able to do their daily functions at a socially distant place, you know, they have an isolated office with no meetings or they work from home, they would also not be uh, yet eligible. Lastly, the Vaccine Task Force shared uh, the tentative schedule for the mass vaccination sites this week. I just want to run over those briefly. First, Angel of the Winds Arena is administering the Johnson & Johnson single dose vaccine uh, using up our remaining supply during today through Thursday. Arlington was open over the weekend and yesterday, but is currently expected to be closed the rest of the week since we don't have any Pfizer doses available to administer through that site. Edmund Co Edmonds College site will have first dose Moderna available today, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. The Boeing Everett Activity Center will also have first dose Moderna availability today through Friday. And the Monroe site will be doing both first and second doses of Moderna today through Saturday. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Executive Summers. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> and let's see, do not have any questions yet. So if you have any questions for us, uh, I will go through them one at a time. Any questions today? All right. Uh, so 300,000 people are eligible in Snohomish County right now. How many people will be eligible starting tomorrow? All right. I might have uh, convoluted things a little bit when I was explaining. So uh, tomorrow, when the gate opens for 1B2, that will include a number of people that if you look all the way back to the beginning, cumulatively from day zero through, net, through that day tomorrow, when those gates open, that's 300,000, of whom about half, mostly people who are in 1A and 1B1, uh, obviously, uh, have been gotten their first dose. So that leaves 150,000 people who are, uh, you know, in those uh, work sectors who meet the 1B2 criteria, remaining people from 1B1, and then just a few stragglers from 1A who, who are eligible but still haven't been vaccinated. So roughly 150 eligible unvaccinated individuals. 150,000, yes. 150,000, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see. Please clarify low vision as a, a criteria for new, the newly eligible. Is vision issues uh, criteria? Yeah, I'd have. I think we'll have to look on the phase finder. I would. Anyone who is, uh, ha you know, it's not just a correction deficiency, or if you've, you know, had. Um, uh, cataract surgery and things replaced. These are people with, with, uh, I think with functional blindness, but we'll, you know, the term we use like 2200 or worse, but, uh, why don't we, instead of me guessing, we'll look that up and get that back to you. Okay. Okay. Um, are the two variants seen in King County showing up here and is either one more dangerous than the original? Well, 
so the B we've uh, to date we've still only got the two B one one sevens that that uh, were picked up through the surveillance testing. Now again, keep in mind that only about uh, somewhere between three and five percent of positive PCR results get forwarded for this sequencing that detects these variants. This is a surveillance tool. It's not a clinical test that comes back on every patient. So uh, the state is using this and the, and the federal government as well to get a general idea of where these are at. So the, you know, the absence of evidence of the presence of these strains in Snohomish County or, you know, of more counts or of the B1135, that's the other one I think you were referring to. You know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, as we say. They're probably in the county. We, they just haven't surfaced through the surveillance yet. I think if, you know, if it's in King County, it's just a question of time till, uh, if not already, it's here. So uh, the key things with these two are that they uh, appear to be transmitted more easily and could lead to more cases and uh, more hospitalizations, deaths, taking us back to where we just came from and don't want to return to. So it, it speaks to all of us, uh, you know, doubling down on those prevention efforts, even while the vaccine is flowing out, even if we have been vaccinated. The goal is to suppress transmission of these and other strains until uh, we can get fully vaccinated. In terms of severity, uh, the, uh, there's, you know, it's it, the, jur the full jury is kind of out still on the B117, but there is a fair amount of data coming in that suggests that risk of death uh, in the UK was increased among individuals with this strain. Uh, I think the, we want to see if that pans out over time here and elsewhere as well. And then the B11351, the, besides increased transmission, the concern with that one is that in the test tube, uh, it's a little bit more um, less neutralized, less stopped by immunity from people who have had COVID or who have been vaccinated. In, in, in humans, the uh, prevention of infection with vaccine um, in communities like in South Africa, where that strain is dominant, it, it doesn't prevent all infections uh, the way uh, it, it, it does where that strain is not uh, um, circulating. So efficacy against catching COVID in that setting is maybe 60% rather than say 90% uh, um, in other settings where that strain is not circulating. But uh, the efficacy in preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death is still just as good as in other settings and with the other vaccines. So um, I think it just speaks to the fact that, you know, ultimately uh, one of these could evade immunity and, and we want to get cases down, get vaccine out. And then, you know, the next step down the road in life is probably going to be adjusting the vaccines in future years as these variants emerge so that we can match up better with them and, and block them from getting transmitted. Okay, um, getting the vaccine is still hard, as you mentioned, a one in 15 <clears throat> chance. <clears throat> when do you think this will start to change? You know? Well, there, it's a, a supply and demand. So uh, as the supply increases, which we, we've been told, uh, you know, as the Johnson & Johnson uh, production ramps up, that we should start seeing increased supplies of that. And then if we see an additional uh, you know, one of the other uh, vaccine products get emergency use authorization. Again, we'll see more supply, so that helps. And then as we work our way through the population and people get vaccinated, then demand will decrease. So we've got, you know, two curves with supply hopefully going up and demand ultimately going down and, and the, the waiting game will become less uh, uh, frustrating for people as time moves ahead. There's a question about the state of testing in the county. Are we seeing a decrease in testing for the virus now that more folks are getting vaccinated? So yes, testing demand has declined both at, at uh, countywide, at the health district sites, uh, 
the Everett Clinic also, you know, we see their, their, their specific data, they share that with us. And so across all settings, uh, you know, uh, testing demand has declined. I think we're down to roughly in the neighborhood of five to 6,000 tests a week. I think we were peaking more up around, I think it was 12 to 15,000 tests a week when, when things were really moving. Positivity rates are declining, but starting to plateau down around four or 5% countywide. Uh, so we think we have enough testing up to uh, one, reach those, you know, through the public settings, through the health district settings, to provide a safety net for those who can't access testing through the traditional healthcare system. Also as a surveillance tool to detect any increases and then also as a uh, sort of a reservoir of capacity from which we could expand uh, if we saw another wave and, and an increase in demand. So for Dr. Smitters, uh, you said the county is seeing a diminishing return on people coming back for their second doses. Uh, does that mean that people aren't coming back for their second doses? Uh, well, I suspect, uh, yes, to, there's, I think there's two factors at play. Roughly, uh, when last I heard, you know, we, we through the mass sites, we reach out because we have those folks emails and we send out reminders and we've gotten about 80, 85 percent of those back. But the, the uh, you know, we've reached diminishing returns. As I said, we have a lot, had a lot of second doses that we got no signups for uh, last week. And so, uh, demand for those remaining doses is low, and I suspect that it's one of two things. Either uh, the folks who got their first dose got the second dose in another county somewhere, and so it, we didn't, you know, really get it counted here, and that's fine as long as they get their second dose. And uh, some people probably, like any, you know, any <laughs> uh, iterative, you know, multiple step process in life, including those in health and medicine, not everyone takes it all the way. And so we do the best we can, but then once we do reach diminishing returns, if someone's not coming back, uh, we're not going to persist too long in that. We're going to move on to, to folks who uh, the first shot will benefit. And so that's what's going on now. And Doctor, is it fair to say too that the vaccine distribution system is kind of uh, uh, not fractured, but uh, there's multiple paths for people to get vaccines that through the, the county and health district system, um, pharmacies, uh, medical establishments, et cetera. So tracking exactly who's getting what, where, and how it all toils up is a little difficult. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes, it's extremely difficult. We have uh, two people almost full time on that right now. And uh, uh, so, we, you know, we do the best we can, but it is, it's harder to track individuals and their outcomes specifically than it is you know, gross numbers of doses administered, uh, indeed. Okay, how are we doing with the continued pressure on the state to increase proportional vaccine allocations? Well, you know, we're, uh, if you look at us over time, cumulatively, we're right at about our, if you look at our, L, at, 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 at the age of the, the, I'm sorry, the number of people living in Snohomish County, over age 16, that's the youngest age eligible for vaccination, uh, we're getting about 10 to 11% of the doses cumulatively that have gone out from the state. And that's the proportion of the population over 16 that we are. So I think, you know, we're, this is where we're at. This, things might, you know, one week we might get a little more or a little less depending on, you know, a new group that comes in that might be in our county, maybe a little bit smaller than the statewide average or a little bit larger. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's pretty much how the state's trying to do it now is to keep it what they call pro rata. So we get, we get our share, uh, our population based share of the eligible population at that time. And, so this is where we're at. Uh, obviously, we, we keep asking for and advocating for getting more, but the, you know, I think the reality is, is they're, they're, we're at our, our per capita share. So what role will vaccination passports play in allowing for travel or even just getting to the movies or restaurants or other places? What about people who are choosing not to be vaccinated? Is this discrimination? 
Uh, oh, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, well, it certainly raises, uh, you know, a lot. There, there are some positive aspects uh, to getting vaccinated in, in addition to protecting one's health. There could be privileges afforded. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, there's some equity issues around uh, if you just haven't been able to get vaccinated yet, but you'd like to, now you're at a disadvantage with those other folks. And then people who um, either due to uh, their personal choices or due to occasionally due to medical conditions, uh, particularly allergy, who don't get uh, vaccinated. You know, there is some discrimination in there. Uh, these uh, matters, the, the police powers uh, regarding, you know, public health are uh, sit with the state uh, on that sort of thing. And, and we'll look to the, I think the federal government and the state to kind of start defining that sort of thing and then we would you know adapt it here uh, we can always be more strict but not less strict than the state on these types of things uh, but i have heard no plans uh, in the works yet about any such regime uh, in in the u.s um correct me if i go astray here but I've, for most of my life uh, getting vaccinations and having proof of those vaccinations has been uh kind of standard operating procedure when you're traveling internationally to many places and uh, much so many years ago. But I, I would fully expect that uh, uh, countries uh, would have requirements, vaccination requirements. I would not be surprised in the least if we see that as a standard part of um, international travel and probably more likely than uh, a restaurant or a theater uh, requiring such kind of vaccination proof, but certainly internationally, that's probably in our future. Is that fair to say? Yes, I would agree. I think those are that, that international movements and, and employment are probably the two sectors where, um, you know, the institution or what have you that we're engaged with might require us to, to be vaccinated to participate. So Dr. Spooners, can you talk more about what it means for the county to be remaining below 100 cases per 100,000? It seems pretty remarkable given the increase in testing access. Well, you know, I think it just speaks to uh, everybody's continued efforts. Um, and uh, that's great news. I would just say, let's keep it up. The lower we can get the this incidence, the longer... Uh, you know, leeway we have to get vaccination out before the next wave might otherwise come. So all I can say is, this is great news. Thank you. Let's keep it up, and um, you know, try to try to prevent another wave. The other thing, just uh, collectively, the less infections that are out there uh, here and abroad. Uh, the less, the, the smaller the pool from which these concerning variants can arise. So not only are we protecting ourselves in the moment when we drive incidents down and have a low prevalence of cases, but we're also protecting our future. And just to stress a point we've made uh, before, the number of tests doesn't really affect the rate that we see because you take the number of tests administered, you see how many people of those had it and you calculate the rate. So number of cases per 100,000 wasn't really uh, significantly affected by having more or fewer tests. Your, your confidence that that number is accurate goes up, but the number itself has you know, it's been pretty standard. So we feel like we're in a really good place. Um, Let's see, can you clarify what you meant by diminishing returns for second doses? So are you saying many people aren't coming back to get their second doses? No, uh, not many, a few. It sounds to like 15% or so not coming back. And, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, obviously we aim for 100%, uh, but, uh, you know, let's not let perfection get in the way of doing good. So we, you know, we've made efforts to, through our mass sites, people that have gotten the first dose that, you know, made lots of efforts to reach out. And there's this kind of crew that we don't hear back from. Probably some of them went and got a second dose somewhere else. 
uh, but some of them probably are, have elected not to come back. But we're not at some point. You got to you know give up the battle to win the war, and we're we're going to move on. Now those folks can always get a second dose. There's no you don't have to restart even if it's been more than six weeks. Ideally, we want people to get that second dose at four to six weeks. But if it doesn't happen and they get it at eight, that's okay. Uh, so if you're out there and you haven't had a second dose yet and you're up, go get it. It's not too late. The next question, are you you're eager to move on to phase three in the county? And what are your thoughts on splitting up the re regions and moving back to county focus to uh, progress in phasing? And I, I just want to say, yes, we're extremely eager um, with some uh, trepidation. Uh, we want to keep the case counts going down. So we're asking everybody to continue to uh, take protective measures that they have, and they've been doing a good job of that. So we don't want to see a bump up, but we know many businesses are hurting and families are hurting, and it's just been a terrible uh, drain on the, both the county and state and the world, frankly. But so we're anxious to move on, uh, pushing the vaccines out as fast as we can, asking people to stay safe. It is not over. It's not time to let up our guard, but uh, moving forward is very exciting from my standpoint. So, doctor. You, you covered it. It's great news. It's great for schools, kids, the economy, uh, healthcare, every, everything. And, and, uh, and it comes with risks. So we're, we're, you know, I urge folks, let's take advantage of these uh, new found liberties, but do so wisely and with respect for this virus, which has shown us several times that it, it doesn't take uh, uh, too much uh, to, for it to research. So keep up the prevention efforts, but let's enjoy what we've earned. Yeah, and I didn't address the, the uh, county by county aspect of this. We, we advocated from day one to kind of maintain a county by county assessment uh, when the state went to regions, um, saw some difficulties there. Uh, nobody wanted to be held back by somebody else or hold somebody else back in a region. So we're very uh, glad we're going back to a county by county assessment. I think it's just really both the fairest and frankly, every county is a little bit different in terms of their culture and their status and just their uh, communities. So we think it makes a lot of sense. We're happy that uh, we're back in a county by county mode. Um, is county considering bolstering security at Angel of Winds given that prep mod doesn't require folks to be eligible? Uh, we know it's an honor system, but people are getting appointments without having to lie about eligibility and some get through. Is it unreasonable to expect people will go through phase finder first? No, not unreasonable at all. And that is our, our, you know, guidance and expectation to the community that, that, you know, step one is phase finder and step two is, is prep mod step, you know, determine eligibility, get that confirmation, then, then register for, for vaccination. Now there's some folks who can't, uh, navigate the system to make that happen. And our call center has capacity uh, to help those folks, uh, particularly, but not exclusively, the elderly and folks needing language assistance. Uh, having said that, you know, we, we do employ common sense. If someone comes through the vaccine site and they're obviously over 65 years of age uh, and they don't have their phase finder, we're, we're, not, gonna, we're not gonna slow them down. If a, a 25 year old comes through without their phase finder, uh, We'll be routing them back uh, to to recheck their their um, eligibility. Uh, so the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, these are large systems, large number of people going through. And hearkening back to my earlier uh, uh, comment, while we want to be fair and just and distribute things in a prioritized fashion that benefits the community most and treats individuals. Uh, um, you know, equal, equitably, uh, you know, if we, you know, get too focused on, on uh, compliance, uh, we can lose velocity. And so 
I'm not promoting, you know, tolerance of the type of thing that you mentioned, but we can we can also get bogged down working too hard to try to suppress that. Uh, so we have to find that that right mix. But certainly, it's expected that people go to Face Finder before making their prep mod appointment. Yeah, and we are asking people to uh, arrive at vaccination sites with some documentation that they are eligible. And as the doctor said, if you, you obviously don't fit one of the categories, it seems like you might you could be checked and you could be turned away. So um, please uh, do bring some documentation of eligibility. Um, every person is not checked, but some you know obvious cases where they don't seem to fit uh, probably will be at any of our county run sites. So just remember the phasing system has really been set up to make sure that the most vulnerable uh, get uh, treated and eligible first. And uh, so it's really for the health of the community that just respect the phases uh, and um, uh, please come with some documentation. Uh, see, the Department of Health is reporting more doses going to hospital systems in the last week or so. Why do you think that is? I can't tell you. Uh, uh, not the case in Snohomish County, and uh, I would I would direct you back to them to answer that. Yeah, I'm aware that uh, some doses, uh, some vaccines going directly from the federal government to some facilities. You know anything about that, doctor? The pharmacies. Can you excuse me? Can you repeat that? Uh, doses vaccine going directly to. Uh, some facilities like pharmacies, but not through the state system. That, that's right. There are about 11,000 uh, doses this week going to retail pharmacies in Snohomish County uh, for administration. That's on top of the 15,000 doses allocated to the health district and healthcare system uh, clinical uh, providers. So the pharmacies have another 11,000 doses. So that brings the county total up to about 26,000 doses. Okay. Um, how are the county's equity measures going? And do you think vaccine hesitancy will naturally wane as more people get their shots? Um, I'll just say we are continuing that work and it's primarily outreach to communities, make sure we're communicating about availability um, and uh, where a vaccine might be available. It, we still remain within the phase system, so we're not um, uh, going outside of the, the current phase system, but we are trying to communicate and target uh, communities that we know have access issues. So I don't know if you want to say more about that, Doctor. No, that's it. That you covered it. It's uh, ongoing work, and uh, you know we won't be through with that work until we're done with the, the whole vaccine effort. It's, it's uh, part and parcel of the whole process, trying to get... Uh, be fair and also uh, account for, for folks who have a harder time for a variety of reasons getting to the vaccine. And that, you know, includes the, the part B of that question was about, you know, people's uh, interest and willingness to get vaccinated and concerns about safety and that sort of thing. And, and I think, you know, what, what the question implied uh, is, is a reasonable thing as, as uh, we get more and more experience and hundreds of thousands of people in the county and millions in the state uh, get vaccinated and uh, we don't see any concerning safety signals beyond what we already knew and have shared with the community. Uh, I think that, you know, many people who may be around the fence about getting vaccinated might might come down off the fence and, and, and get vaccinated. We won't convince everyone, uh, but I think we just want everyone uh, who, who wants it to have, have access to it. And we want everyone to have the information to make a good decision for themselves and their families. And just <clears throat> emphasis on the equity measures, we are uh, working with community leaders uh, and these are relationships we really uh, grew during the census work a year or two ago. So uh, really relying on people that various communities trust, community leaders, uh, whose word is trusted to um, pass on information about vaccines and assure people that they're safe. Uh, and uh, so using those uh, connections uh, where somebody might not trust what I say, uh, we're looking for people out there in the community that people do trust. So that's uh, the emphasis of that work, uh, a strong emphasis. 
So with St. Patrick's Day this week, are we worried about another holiday spread? Oh. Well, uh, you know, it's a good time for all people with uh, Irish ancestry and those uh, who uh, like Irish culture to, to you know, uh, uh, celebrate, uh, you know, the Irish heritage in our country. Uh, but I would discourage, you know, getting together uh, in, in gatherings of multiple households, getting together in bars, that sort of thing, because those are the kinds of, you know, not every gathering is going to be a problem, but one or more of them could become a super spreading event. And then, and then we do have a problem. So just like any cause to get together, whether it's a, or, you know, a traditional holiday or a football game or, you know, you name it. Uh, this is another area where, you know, hopefully folks will kind of have the brakes on and, and do it wisely and small and simple. Uh, rather than maybe our more traditional um, efforts on these days. I think uh, we got to the bottom. And just note there's a, a definition of low vision uh, that's been put in the chat box. This is Kristen in the Joint Information Center. Thank you again for joining us today and for your questions. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Please stay tuned for future media availabilities.